Welcome to Hot Chips 20. Session 1. Multicore Technologies. Hot Chips 20 Organizing Committee. Hot Chips presents the latest and most ambitious chip developments from the world's top chip makers and emergency startups. I was telling a friend about this and he seemed very interested until I realized that he thought I had said hot chicks, but no. <laughs> this year is the 20th Hot Chips Conference since it was founded in 1989 by Bob Stewart and while we look back on many of the most exciting developments in the microprocessor and chip industry, we also look forward to even more innovative developments in the years to come. This year we have an outstanding program of tutorials, technical presentations, keynote speeches, and a notable panel discussion. The tutorials led off with high bandwidth memory technology and systems implications, chaired by Chuck Moore and featuring Jerry Bautista of Intel, Craig Hampel of Rambus, and Fritz Kruger of AMD. The second tutorial, chaired by John Nichols, entitled Scalable Parallel Programming with uh, CUSA, featured authors Ian Buck, Michael Garland, Patrick Legresley, and Massimiliano Faticha of NVIDIA, and Wen Mei Hu of the University of Illinois. The first technical session today, Multi-Core Technologies, chaired by Will Etherington, showcases papers by Three Leaf Systems, UC Berkeley, and IBM. The first keynote, chaired by Christos Kozouakis, is entitled Cars That Drive Themselves by Sebastian Thrun of Stanford. The afternoon session, Video and Media, chaired by Pradeep Duby, includes papers by Toshiba, UC Davis, and NXP Semiconductor, and AMD. The Mobile Media Processing Session, chaired by Forrest Basket, features papers by Telligent, Audience, and NVIDIA. This is followed by the session on supercomputing chaired by Ralph Wittig with papers from IBM and D.E. Shaw. Following dinner in Dorman Grove will be our panel chaired by Nick Tredenick entitled Ready, Fire, Aim, 20 Years of Hits and Misses at, at Hot Chips with our selection of outspoken panelists Nathan Brookwood, Dave Ditzel, John Mashey, David Patterson, Howard Sachs and Michael Slater. Tuesday begins with the FPGA session chaired by Christy uh, Azanovich with papers from Xilinx, Altera, and Maxilar. Following that is the PC chip session chaired by John Sell featuring presentations from AMD, the Institute of Computing Technology of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and Intel. The second keynote chaired by Forrest Basket is entitled SunPower's History and Technology by Richard Swanson. The following session on networking is chaired by Jose Renault with papers from DS2 and Cisco. The session entitled Visual Computing, chaired by Marc Tremblay, includes papers by NVIDIA and Intel. And the last session of the conference, entitled Server Chips, chaired by Alan J. Smith, promises to be especially interesting and features papers by Intel, Fujitsu, and Sun. This outstanding selection of tutorials and presentations is the result of much hard work by program committee led by Christos Kozouakis and Jan Willem van der Vert. They have done a great job in soliciting the papers, evaluating, selecting the best from the many high quality submissions and then working with the authors in the various sessions to get the presentations ready. We appreciate the contributions of Christy Ivana Azanovich, Forrest Basket, Pradeep Duby, Will Etherington, Matt Farns, Chuck Moore, John Nichols, Jose Renault, Mitsui Saito, Alan J. Smith, John Sell, Mark Tremblay, and Ralph Wittig. Two of these members, Chuck Moore and Jose Renault, have been stricken by serious illnesses and are unable to attend. We salute them here for their great contributions and keep them in our thoughts, wishing them a complete recovery. The conference presentations have been distributed on one gigabyte flash drives to all attendees and printed copies were available if ordered at sign up. The presentations are sometimes updated just before the conference, which adds to the up-to-the-minute nature and will be available for download from the website using a password to be given to the attendees. 
Similarly, the updated tutorial presentation will be mounted on the website and made available by password to tutorial present, uh, <coughs> uh, made available by password to the uh, tutorial attendees. This year, we are again making video recordings of the tutorials and all sessions, including the panel. These will be available on DVDs from the online store. The complete set sells for $795 and individual sessions and keynotes for $195 each. All of the presentations from the last 19 years of Hot Chips have been collected onto an archival DVD which is being given to each attendee. The Hot Chips conference would not be possible without the outstanding contributions and hard work of members of the organizing committee. I would like to acknowledge the following members for their, valuing, for, for their valued uh, contributions. Yusuf Abdul Ghani for implementing new technology for the website, registration and submission software, and organizing the video production. John Sell for setting up caterers and taking care of all food organization. Alexis Cordova for maintaining the website. Mike Sobelman for managing registration and dealing with the many questions that come up as attendees register. Lily Zhao for maintaining finances and putting together the budget. Gordon Garb and Randall Neff for gathering all of the presentations and getting them printed and for making the archival DVD. Keith Diefendorf as vice chair, working across lines to make the conference successful. Lance Hammond for working with Stanford to reserve the Memorial Auditorium and providing the facilities, especially difficult this year due to renovation. Charlie Newhauser for programming the flash drives and organizing the on-site volunteers and to the volunteers themselves who provide so much assistance during the conference itself. Kevin Cruel for handling publicity and providing an interface to the, to the press to provide pre-conference publicity. Gail Sachs, who acquired shirts for the committee members and bags for the attendees. Amar Zaki, who worked with sponsors to support the conference. And Alan Baum, who along with Slava Mach, produced the advertising for email and printed distribution. I also want to give thanks to the steering committee, Don Elpert, Lily Zhao, Alan Baum, Pradeep Duby, John Mashey, Howard Sachs, and Alan J. Smith, and to our founder, Bob Stewart. We especially appreciate the contributions made by our sponsors, AMD, Intel, Rambus, Worthman Associates, Arithmetica, Berkeley Design Technology, Silmines, Micromagic, the Multicore Association, Circuit Seller, and the Embedded Microprocessor Benchmark Consortium. In, in addition to these, our technical sponsors are the Technical Committee on Microprocessors and Microcomputers of the IEEE Computer Society and the IEEE Solid State Circuit Society. I would like to also mention that tonight, uh, right after dinner and right before the panel discussion, we will be having a special celebration of uh, the uh, 20th Hot Chips Conference with a, uh, a special cake, which will be uh, cut by uh, our founder, Bob Stewart. And last, I thank all of you, the attendees who support our conference, so we can continue to bring you the best program and conference experience. We solicit your feedback. Please fill out the evaluation forms and make your opinions known. I hope you have a stimulating and enjoyable conference. Thank you. Christos Kozouakis of the Program Committee will now speak. Uh, good morning, everybody. On behalf of the Program Committee and as a local person, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the Stanford campus. So this year, we got about uh, 64 submissions uh, for hardships, and after very careful consideration by the whole Program Committee, we selected the 25 that we think they represent the most exciting developments in our field. Uh, if you look at your program, we have everything from the latest server chips all the way to devices for uh, mobile and embedded systems. So we have everything from teraflops to milliwatts, which would make it a very interesting program. Uh, as expected, about three quarters of the program are about uh, multi-core, uh, just like the first session. And if you're keeping score, the highest uh, core count uh, this year is going to be 240 cores. Uh, the runner-up is 167, so that's the bar for next year if you want to submit something more than 240. 
Uh, we're also very happy to follow the tradition of having a number of international talks from uh, Japan, Europe, and China. And we also have a number of outstanding academic talks. So it should be a great program. We hope you enjoy it, and uh, we uh, welcome you uh, all here. And we also hope that you participate uh, uh, as much as possible through the question and answer session. So before I turn it over to Will Etherton to introduce the first uh, session, I would like to uh, ask you all as a courtesy to the speakers to switch your cell phones to silent or vibrate. And with that, Will. Good morning, I'm Randall Neff. I'm a volunteer at the Computer History Museum, and we're just going to do a quick update on what the Computer Museum is doing and how that reflects the hot chips. So we have this beautiful building, courtesy of Silicon Graphics in 94. They built it. We bought it. Uh, too much. OK, first item, a brand new president and CEO, John C. Holler. He started July 1st. He worked at FCC, PBS, and he'll be leading the museum through the next growth phase. But the cool thing is, we have the second implementation of the Babbage Difference Engine. This was designed in 1847 by Charles Babbage. Weighs five tons, 8,000 parts. Used zero watts of electrical power. The reason is it's hand cranked. Uh, for you architecture guys, it has seven 31 decimal digit adders all running in a pipeline configuration with a true ripple carry up the back. And it does that in two phases. It does four ads and three ads. And it does this in six seconds, being hand cranked. Uh, so we have this cool Babbage exhibit. It was built with the funding from Nathan Mervold, and he has loaned it to the museum for a year. So it's cool. We have lots of stuff. The other exciting thing is we have worked out a deal with YouTube. So there's a Computer History Museum channel on YouTube. So we're putting up our hour, hour plus lectures that we've done. And we've had a lot of famous people come by and say hello. We're also putting up a lot of historical videos about exciting things in the past. You know, like this film from 1982 talking about how you can revol revolutionize your company by doing a central mainframe in these CRT terminals. Uh, we have a bunch of special projects, including restoration. But of interest is there's a new special interest group on semiconductors. And so the idea is to preserve the history of the semiconductor companies. Most of, the, most of you in here are involved in some way or the other. So we have a section of the website. There's meetings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is the ideas of. Um, you know, what they're doing. Uh, the collection wish list is of particular importance to this group. They have a website. We do a lot of events here. There's about one lecture a month. Uh, and on September the 11th, we're having a lecture on the history of the IBM Stretch Computer, which is really cool. The Fellows Awards, which is our big, formal, expensive honors dinner, is October the 21st. We're honoring Gene Bartek, who was a programmer on the ENIAC. Uh, Bob Metcalf, who invented Ethernet, plus or minus, and Linus Tervols. And then the next night, on October the 22nd, Jean will be giving a lecture on her life at, with um, ENIAC. So, you know, how you can help? Give us money, become a member, get on the mailing list, come to our lectures. But the last item is, I did the uh, archive DVD that you got. And there's an immense amount of history sitting here in this audience, both this year at Hot Chips and previous years. So look in your closets, in your basement, in your attics, and see if you have some really cool stuff that you think should be preserved. Go to the museum website. There's a whole page on donations. Tell us what you got. They vet it. They get back to you, yes, no, probably yes with this audience. And that's it. Thank you very much.
Hello, uh, my name is uh, Will Leatherton from Cisco Systems, and I'm uh, very happy to uh, be introducing the, the first session this morning. Um, the first two speakers are for three leaf, from Three Leaf Systems, and I'm gonna ask them to go ahead and start heading up here. Um, and the two speakers are Shay Krikarian, who's a principal engineer at Three Leaf, um, and Krishnan Subramani, who's a uh, engineer at Three Leaf. Um, Shay uh, has, has uh, 20 years of experience, um, Brocade, JNI, ST Micro, and uh, uh, Krishnan has uh, 10 years of experience at companies like HP and, and PMC Sierra. So uh, they're going to be talking about a, a system, a system chip for network coherency, um, that or network-based coherency that uh, uh, does employ multi-core. Um, as as uh, Christos mentioned, a uh, large theme of all the talks, uh, or many of the talks today, is multi-core, and uh, these are, are talks that uh, put multi-core into a, a system or system analysis context. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Shay and, and Krishnan. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Bill. Um, hi, my, uh, I'm Shahe, and Christian and I will be talking today about a chip we developed at Three Leaf that allows the coherency domain of a processor to be extended over a standard network. So just a quick uh, overview of the, uh, of the flow of the presentation. I'll start with the high-level goals uh, of the problems we're trying to solve, and then I'll go into some uh, relevant industry trends that we have leveraged, and then I'll present a system-level view of the solution then dig into the chip itself. I'll provide an overview, and then Krishnan, after that, will go into the de details of how we manage uh, cache coherency in, uh, in hardware. So uh, why network-based coherency? Well, the problem we're trying to solve is uh, related to the way servers are deployed in the data center today. A typical physical server is uh, is uh, installed with a dedicated set of CPU memory and I.O. resources. And, uh, um, and this often results in low server utilization and also makes it, uh, makes it difficult to scale and move these resources. So, so as a solution, uh, um, you could basically, if, if you had a set of uh, shared resources that are provisioned dynamically to servers as these servers are, are deployed, uh, that would make the, the, the entire system much more flexible and, and, and solve some of these problems that I, that I mentioned. Um, uh, as an example, in this diagram, we show a set of CPU and memory and I.O. resources being provisioned to a particular system, which is running in guest OS. Um, so the, so, so, so uh, in order to come up with the solution, what we'd like to do is we'd like to take these resources and interconnect them over a standard network. Uh, with coherency running in hardware. And also we'd like to leverage um, as much as possible ex existing commodity solutions so that the cost, overall cost and complexity of the solution is low. Um, so there are several industry trends that we have leveraged um, uh, towards this goal, and I will co cover some of those. Um, so one of these trends is the uh, evolution of processor interconnect from uh, a shared bus to a, uh, if you will, a micro network such as coherent hypertransport or quick path. So as a logical next step, you could think of um, using standard network to extend this interconnect in order to increase the scalability and the flexibility of the, uh, of the system. Um, another trend that uh, we are leveraging is the support for uh, virtual machine monitors in uh, processors, thereby uh, uh, lower, significantly lowering the uh, software overhead of running uh, virtual systems on, uh, on, on these processors. Uh, yet another trend to look at is the increase in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the networking bandwidth over time. If you compare that to the increase in CPU clock frequencies, then you can see that the network bandwidth increase has actually outpaced the uh, the, the CPU uh, clock rate increase. And uh, that just makes it more feasible to use the, a network to, to interconnect CPUs and to, to run coherent transactions over the network. And finally, if we look at the uh, trend for uh, um, latency over a, uh, a standard network switch, over time you can see that over a period of 10 years, the um, the network latency has improved by uh, about two to three orders of magnitude. In the same amount of time, DRAM latency has improved only marginally. 
what that means is that the, uh, the penalty of accessing uh, remote memory over a network has uh, significantly been reduced, uh, been reduced uh, during this period of time. So putting this all together, what we'd like to do is we'd like to have a set of, uh, set of servers that are, contain CPU and memory resources and interconnect them over a standard network. However, uh, we need to run coherent transactions over the network. And in order to do that, uh, we need something uh, that we're calling this coherent network controller, which can manage coherency in, in, in hardware. Another view of the system is from the standpoint of the hardware software partitioning. So with the hardware system that I just uh, showed in the previous slide, uh, what we get is a, the hardware presents a coherent distributed shared memory view to the, uh, to the software. And then uh, low-level software then manages this environment uh, with the agile provisioning and allocation of the resources. And the uh, OS and the applications then get a dynamic view of the underlying hardware. Uh, zooming in on a particular uh, physical server or node that contains the CPU and memory, uh, this is one example where we show uh, a couple of CPUs as well as the coherent network controller. And these are interconnected using uh, either coherent hypertransport or quick path. Uh, the CPUs obviously have attached memory, which are the memory resources we're talking about. The coherent network controller itself has some attached memory, which is used as a, what we're calling the local node cache. And then the controller also provides the interconnect over InfiniBand or Ethernet for the uh, coherent uh, traffic that's going to basically uh, go across the, the network. So Three Leaf's first implementation of the coherent network controller is the TL1550 ASIC. Uh, the block diagram is shown here. Uh, starting out from the left side, we have two coherent hypertransport ports. Uh, each of these ports has a bandwidth of about uh, of up to eight gigabytes per second bidirectional. These connect to the coherent memory manager module shown in blue here, uh, which is the heart of the chip. So this block uh, can handle um, up to one terabyte of system memory and it handles all, all, uh, all the coherent transactions in hardware. And it also manages the local node cache shown at the top, uh, which is accessed through the DDR2 SDRM controller block. In addition, we have a DMA and message manager block, which uh, provides support for non-coherent I.O. transactions, just to complement the coherent uh, transaction capability of the, of the coherent memory manager. Uh, then we have a reliable delivery manager module, which uh, implements a reliable end-to-end uh, -end, uh, transport for uh, all transactions that go across the coherent fabric. And then finally, the interconnect to the fabric is provided through two high-speed ports, uh, which can be configured as either InfiniBand or Ethernet. Um, in InfiniBand mode, uh, the, each of these ports is a 4x IB port running at SDR or DDR uh, with a bandwidth of up to 20 gigabits per second per direction. And in Ethernet mode, uh, each of these ports is a 10 gig port, although we also support the non-standard uh, rate of 20 gig Ethernet. I will now talk a little bit about the reliable delivery function, uh, and then from there we'll move on to talk about the details of uh, cache coherency. So, uh, so in order to run coherent memory transactions over the fabric, we need a protocol that uh, um, has very low transport overhead in order to support the, or in order to efficiently support the short packets involved with uh, coherent transactions. Uh, we need reliable end-to-end -end delivery. We need uh, support for multipathing for high availability. Uh, the solution we developed, we wanted it to be uh, layer two agnostic. Uh, and uh, finally, um, uh, we would like to optionally run non-coherent uh, transactions over the fabric, also over the same protocol. So um, in order to uh, address these requirements, we defined and, uh, and uh, implemented a uh, reliable delivery protocol. It is a very lightweight uh, transport 
that uh, um, uh, provides end-to-end uh, uh, -end reliable delivery over the fabric. It is layer two agnostic, it runs over IB or ethernet, uh, provides automatic retry so that we can recover from link errors uh, uh, very quickly. Also provides automatic path failover in order to recover from port failures or switch failures in the fabric. Um, it supports multiple transaction level protocols, uh, both coherent as well as non-coherent. And finally, it uh, does use multiple virtual channels for quality of service. Uh, and as a result, we can ensure uh, minimal lat latency for coherent packets over the, over the fabric. So a quick look at the uh, RDP packet format and the overhead involved, just to demonstrate the, the low overhead of the protocol. So every RDP packet uh, has an eight byte header, which includes some uh, connection identifiers, a sequence number, retry number, some other information. And RDP, an RDP packet also carries uh, acknowledge information for packets that have been received in the opposite direction. Then putting this all together, uh, we, an RDP packet is then formed with the header, a variable size payload that's provided by the transaction layer, and one or two acts. And when we run this over InfiniBand, then on, you know, on top of that, we append the IB link header and the CRCs. And we end up with a total uh, IB plus RDP overhead of uh, 28 bytes, which also includes the uh, start and end of packet delimiters not shown in this diagram. When we're running over Ethernet, uh, it's a very similar picture. We're just doing the Ethernet encapsulation with the preamble and the Ethernet header, uh, and at the end, appending the Ethernet uh, FCS. And in this case, we end up with an overhead of 50, about 54 bytes, which also takes into account the interframe requirement and interframe gap requirement of, uh, of Ethernet. So uh, this is just to demonstrate the, uh, uh, I guess, the efficiency and the low overhead of the protocol. At this point, I'm going to hand it over to, over to Krishnan, who is going to talk uh, in more detail about uh, how coherency is managed in hardware. Krishnan. Thanks, Shahi. <coughs> So uh, I'm going to be talking about the cache coherency, how, how the chip uh, implements the cache coherency, and what are the features we have put in, and some of the, the, the mic. Mic. The mic is not on. Let me turn it on. Oops. I don't know. Oh, it works now. Okay. Sorry about that. I'll just use this mic. Okay. So um, I'm going to be talking about the um, how how we manage cache coherency and um, some of the features implemented in the coherent memory manager in the in the TL1550 by the coherent memory manager. Uh, as uh, Shahe mentioned, uh, it implements the cache coherency function of the TL1550 and manages all the on the hypertransport side, it behaves like a CPU sitting on the coherent bus. So uh, when it issues a request, it looks like an optron. And when it receives a request, it uh, acts and behaves like a memory controller similar to another optron sitting on, on the hypertransport bus. It has two links, and it might talks to, uh, it can support up to two, directly connected up to two uh, uh, optrons, but it can support more than that. It implements a node cache to, uh, to cache the remote access. And we'll get to the more details of that in just a bit. And as I said, mentioned before, the um, cache coherency is, has two parts to it. One of this is called the line caching, which tracks granular, uh, in a cache line granularity. The other one is a page caching, which tracks the uh, ca cache coherency in a, in a, in a page granular, 4K page granularity. More details on both of these coming up shortly. So all said and done, the network is getting uh, faster. The access is getting slower. Latency is lower. But still, uh, going over the network is, is expensive. And a primary concern for us has been to remove this latency and to reduce this latency as to as low as possible. So we have leveraged certain uh, industry trends. Uh, and uh, put in uh, certain uh, of our own functions in both software and hardware. Uh, the first of it is that the operating systems themselves, as long as you can tell them what is the penalty for going to different uh, to access different memory, it 
determines uh, the, the memory locations appropriately and optimizes it. So that's something we get for free from the current operating systems. On top of that, our software has implemented intelligent page placement and page replication to optimize, uh, to make sure that the, the relevant pages are accessed locally. And we'll not get much into that layer in this presentation. We're going to focus on the, on the ASIC. So on the ASIC side, it implements mainly the cache currency in hardware. That's primarily how we get the, the performance out of it. And to, implement, to do that, it does a, a couple of different uh, optimizations. First of all is the line caching, where it does all the hardware uh, cache currency in, um, for each cache line that is uh, passed between nodes. And it also implements a feature called, we call page caching, which, uh, which in conjunction with software, so the software tells the hardware that these are the interesting hot pages to cache, and the hardware takes on from then on, tracking the cache currency on a per cache line basis, and making sure that everything is coherent. And on top of that, we have one, a few more uh, uh, interesting features. One of them we'll get to is called the Fast and Validate, which we call the Coherency Acceleration Technologies. So let's focus a little bit on the node cache. So the node cache helps reduce the latency. So one of the uh, major concerns was to reduce the latency and uh, reduce the penalty for going uh, from node to node. And the, the main, uh, main feature that does that is the node cache. Uh, it uh, stores all the remote data on the local uh, DRAM that's attached to TL1550. And that sort of acts like uh, a, a last level cache for, um, for, the, uh, for the system, for that node. So any, any uh, access that goes to a remote node comes back and is cached locally uh, in, the, in the DRAM. And the tags that identify which, which, caches, which lines are cached and so on is stored internally for better performance so that you get uh, full, clocks, uh, full, um, full rate access to the tags. The cache itself is divided into two parts, the line cache and the page cache. The line cache is the traditional uh, caching hierarchy where you manage each cache line on a cache line granularity and then figure out who owns the line, who has the line modified, where the data exists, and so on. It implements a MOSI coherency protocol, and it's 64 by, by uh, cache line granularity with eight, eight ways set associative. The page cache is an interesting uh, optimization that we've put in. Uh, one of the primarily disadvantages of the line cache is that you need to track each cache line individually, and that is expensive in terms of uh, resources. So the page cache slightly alleviates that problem. So instead of tracking on each cache line basis, you track it on a per page basis. <clears throat> so the software comes and uses some heuristics and some algorithms and uh, some features implemented in the hardware, figures out which are the hot pages to cache, and then tells the hardware that you need to cache these pages. From then on, the hardware kicks on. It tracks those pages, tracks them on a, uh, on a it, it knows which pages are caching, but it tracks them on a per cache line granularity. So there is, it's not that these pages are read only. They are full, they are just like anything else, except that the, you get high efficient u, uh, utilization of the on-chip resources because you're tracking on a 4K byte cache line and not a 64 byte cache line, and that's like a 64 exp, uh, resource impro uh, improvement. And there are certain features implemented in the hardware that helps the software to determine which pages are hot pages, like looking at the, there is a page search engine which, tell, which the software can invoke to figure out which are the pages that are most frequently accessed. And there are read write bits in the, in the tags to figure out which are the pages that are least frequently accessed so it can be uh, removed. So this is the animation on how uh, the basic cache coherency scheme works and remote access works. Uh, this, you know, the first microprocessor issues a read to an, ad to an address that's on a remote node, and it misses in its local cache. Whoops. Is the animation working? Uh, animation. Oh, the animation is not working for some reason. Oh, well. Okay. We'll just talk through it. Press return. Hmm? Is this working? Nope. Are we stuck? Looks like we're already yeah. stuck. So while while it's going, this is a pointer that uh, helps if you want. Okay, to. thanks. So the server one is the requesting node, and it makes a request. The CPU on the server requesting node makes a request, and it misses its local cache, so it uh, gets to the TL1550. 
TL1550 looks at its own internal cache and figures out that it's missing in its node cache. So it sends the request all the way over to this node, which is, happens to be its home node. And here, the, the chip gets the request, sends it over to the appropriate microprocessor memory controller, and the memory controller performs its coherency and sends back the data, and which ships over back to the TL50 on the requesting node. There, it sends the data back to the requesting microprocessor at the same time, sends the uh, data, stores the data in its local cache as a cache fill for future requests. Did we need to move the cursor here? Are we okay. stuck? No, go ahead. No, it doesn't. Hold on. Is it frozen? Yeah. Looks like it is, for some reason. Is Randy, we so need to. Yeah. OK. Looks like we're going to have to reboot. Just, uh, <laughs> oh, wait. Did it this come back? Works, but not that one. Right. Oh, the external display. Um, was. OK, let's try to go back. That's weird. So this is OK, but it's not updating. Um, is that the, the slide had an animation. That's why. Um, <laughs> probably. Oh, that's me. That's not going to work. It's a cursor. Lost the cursor. <sighs> you see the cursor? Yeah. All right, we're going to read the. One takeaway, maybe animations or. or <laughs> <laughs> we upgraded to PowerPoint 2007, and we've had lots of trouble with it. Did we just lose it. Finally. I don't know if there are any, uh, looks like we may have a moment here. <laughs> Is it frozen? It's frozen, it's still frozen. We may need another laptop, it's possible. Well, the problem is that I don't have the latest slides. Oh, the second one. So yeah, is there, uh, <laughs> looks like we have a minute. Uh, sure. Are there any questions? Sure, like, go ahead. Two questions, one, uh, Dave Patterson from Berkeley. One was, what's going to be the round trip latency? And the other one is the cost, the per node cost, cost about the cost of an Opteron, or is it more or less? So uh, latency from load to use latency for an access to a remote um, node depends on, on the kinds of network, whether DDR or infinite band or Ethernet, and the kind of switch you use. But we estimate it to be less than one microsecond. Uh, we, uh, it, it's, it's not a real tight number, but it depends on a various factors. It also depends on the frequency you're running your processors at the home and remote node, but it's, so, it's definitely less than a microsecond. So uh, range might be half a microsecond to a microsecond, something like that? Yeah, something like that. What, what, and is the cost per server cost of a node like the cost of another microprocessor, or what's an example? Yeah, the, what, what I can tell you is that this should not significantly affect the cost of the server that, has, that is 3-leaf enabled. That ASIC should not significantly affect the cost. Of, if you buy a server um, and it has the 3-leaf enabled device on it, it shouldn't significantly affect the cost of the versus another one that doesn't have it. Does that answer your question? It, I don't think it does, but let me, is it is like DRAM, is it like a DRAM module? The, uh, you, are you talking about the form factor or? No, the, just the, 
the delta and cost. What, I, what other component is it similar to? Uh, like it, a much, much less than a microprocessor. OK. Much, much less than a microprocessor, yes. Hello? I have a question? Sure. Yeah. Um, so you talked about the node cache, but as far as between the nodes, how do you maintain coherency between the nodes? Do you use kind of a Snoopy protocol or a directory-based protocol? There is a directory-based protocol. Okay, and that's stored on the node controller? Yes. Do you use, uh, do you use a cache line granularity and page granularity for the directory? There are both. Um, both? On, okay. uh, uh, there are two, co two kinds of caching. The cache line granularity, which is completely managed in hardware, that you boot the system up, it's working, versus a page caching where the software comes in, comes online, and it figures out which are the pages that, that are most interesting to be cached, and then programs it in the hardware, and from then on, it's hardware. Uh, ca hardware takes care of the managing the coherency. OK, so the page cache is only set up by the software. It's not automatically uh, set up by hardware, then? No. It's not alloc the allocation and replacement of the page Just is done by the software, the and the hardware. management is done by hardware. OK, thanks. Hi. Last year, AMD was shopping for accelerators and CPUs as long as it wouldn't impact their cost or power budget. So what envelope do you fit in that doesn't impact their cost or power budget? It, on the power, it's less than uh, 20 watts uh, as measured with, with, uh, with the attached DRAMs. Uh, the cost, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I don't have the numbers with me. I'm an engineer. <laughs> A, we have an AMD hypertransport technology license, yes. Are they licensed to your, your, your To the coherent network controller, yes. Like AMD, AMD has, we have licensed the, the coherent hypertransport technology from AMD, not the other way around. Can you say a little bit more about how software manages this page cache? I mean, is there application uh, changes involved, or is it completely uh, operating system? First of all, there is no application or operating system change involved. Um, the, the page cache is an optimization to how you use the on-chip resources. So the software comes, and there are built-in uh, uh, algorithms and uh, helper functions, if you want to call it, in the hardware on the ASIC that it triggers. And it goes and figures out uh, which are the pages that are more interesting to be cached, which are which give you the maximum performance. And then it reports back, but it doesn't actually invoke the allocation mechanism. It leaves it to the so hardware. And the reason is that uh, over time, as we understand more about the application and the operating system, and maybe even different applications and different operating system have different usage models, uh, we could improve and customize this software while having the hardware intact. So it gives us much lesser uh, turnaround time to respond as opposed to having to respin the hardware to, uh, to go to a new uh, uh, usage model. There we are. OK. Sure. OK. So we're going to go ahead and resume the presentation, we think. Is this it? Uh, is that what? Is this the right slide? Or is it? Uh, yeah. Just but that, these don't. I know. Uh, keep tapping here, that's fine. So if this is not synchronized with the yeah. um, overhead. Okay. One more? Yeah. No. Uh it's called a little more. One, two. There you go. That one. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So We'll jump over this really quickly. Um, first, the microprocessor issues a request, sends it over to the, uh, misses in its cache, uh, sends it over to the uh, TL1550, sends it over to the remote node, over to the memory controller that has the, the cache line and ships the data back, and which gets returned to the microprocessor as well as returned to the node cache. OK, now we'll jump to the, the other interesting aspect of uh, TL1550 is one of the coherency acceleration technologies called Fast and Validate. So what is Fast and Validate? One of the thorny problems with cache coherency, especially in a large uh, shared system, is that once you have these node caches and different caches caching these cache lines all over the place, when somebody wants to store it, now you have to go invalidate all these cache lines. So this is where that helps. So there are two modes of operation of, uh, actually I shouldn't call it two modes, there are two 
two ways to um, invoke fast and validate. One is called the lockdown and the blocking. We'll get to how, how it works a little bit later. Uh, but what it does essentially is that once you have a, a cache line that's shared by multiple people and somebody who wa who's shared wants to make a store, it lets them make the store really fast, out of order, uh, sort of breaking locally, breaking the, uh, the XHSIG ordering model and committing the store before it's visible to the other nodes. And TL 1550 comes in, comes in the middle and enables the uh, blocking to make sure that the overall in the system, the X86 coherency model, the, the uh, read-write ordering model is, is not broken. And on top of that, we have a delayed blocking mechanism which alleviates some of the uh, drawbacks of the fast and validate. So let's look at the lockdown mode for fast and validate. A CPU issues a request which gets to the TL1550, which lives on a remote node, so it sends it over to the fabric, and the response comes back. Now, this line is also shared by, let's say, five other nodes who have not been validated yet. So those responses are still have been issued, but they haven't, we haven't received confirmation that they have been validated. In the traditional system, it couldn't be used until the, all of this uh, invalidates were received, and then you would uh, tell the CPU that, go ahead, use the line. But we create a, a five data barrier, and then sends the response over to the uh, CPU so that it can start using it. So the CPU doesn't know anything about this data barrier. Let's say later on it wants to send some data back on the fabric. This data barrier blocks it, blocks it, but note that it blocks it only on the outgoing side, not from the fabric. And sometime later, the response comes back from its peer, and it, it receives all the responses. At that time, the barrier is removed, and the data uh, goes back to the network. So this is completely transparent to the processor, uh, except that it, it lets it st uh, commit its store much faster. So there is a different uh, aspect of fast and validate that is on the remote node. So in the, in the previous slide, we saw invalidates being sent to the remote nodes. Now this is what happens on the remote nodes if, if, if fast and validate is enabled. It receives a probe to invalidate its cache line. And it turns around and immediately says, hey, I've invalidated your cache line. Go ahead. Meanwhile, the x CPUs may still have their cache line cached. So that's why you create a data barrier to prevent uh, data from leaking out. Meanwhile, the probes are sent out, and they're invalidating the cache. If a data comes in, the da barrier blocks it until all we receive confirmation from the, uh, the CPUs that the line has been invalidated, and then the data moves. These are not two independent modes of operation. They can coexist. So in this example, a probe comes to the, can you see, OK. Uh, the, the request is going to the local memory controller, and the probe comes, and we immediately turn around and put the device in a lockdown mode and send a response, meanwhile sending response to the remote node. And the same thing happens. The remote node sends, out, sends back its uh, fast and validated response immediately while nuking the local caches. Note that the blocking for the remote node is not enabled yet. So in this node, the blocking is not enabled yet. That's what we call enhanced delay blocking. What it allows us to do is that allows us to utilize the latency of this fast and validated response going to the remote node uh, to let open the gate just a little bit longer so that in most cases, that blocking would never even, ex it never even come into play. So ma while this fast and validated response is making its way to the home node, the, uh, the, block, uh, the, the CPUs are being invalidated. And then while its response comes back, this is the, the, the response is going back to the remote node, and its lockdown gets cleared, and then the blocking from that gets cleared. So in most cases, this latency is so large that the invalidates are completed uh, before the blocking even begins. So there is no, virtually no blocking in this case. But in case something gets delayed, that blocking comes into act, act and it uh, prevents, the, uh, prevents the data from leaking out. So why do fast and validate? As I said before, if you have a la large amount of shared data, it enables you to do a fast store while uh, not having to invalidate every, everyone at the same time. Um, a little bit about the ASIC. Shows you the two hypertransport interfaces, um, two uh, CERDES links. The coherent memory manager, the SDRAM controller, DMA manager, 
and the reliable delivery manager. Statistics, it's in TSMC 90GT, 400 megahertz core frequency with standard ASIC flow, uh, 6 million gates, 24 megabits of repairable SRAM, 607 pins, uh, 10 by 10 by 7 by 10.3 mm with a uh, Torrenza package consuming a less than 20 watts of power. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, due to the, uh, the, the mid-talk Q&A session, the unplanned session, um, we'll take one or two questions uh, uh, before we move to the next uh, talk, but we'll, we'll shorten the Q&A period a little bit. So any any questions? We have one coming over here. So can you say how large uh, systems you can scale to using the, uh, this chip? S the uh, coherent system can be 16 nodes, with each node containing as many CPUs as possible. Uh, as, I mean, there's no limit on the number of sockets on each node, but 16 coherent nodes, but the system itself can large to much, much, much larger. Uh, as as long as long as you can have you can limit the coherent domain to only 16. Regarding the uh, fast invalidate, what happens if two nodes simultaneously trying to update the same address? One of them gets uh, ordered ahead of the other. So one node gets ordered, and then behind it the other one gets ordered by by the memory controller at the home node. Thanks very much. Thank you. So the next uh, speaker, and uh, if Randy's here, I'm still having a little trouble getting this uh, display over to the left here. Um, so the, the next speaker uh, from UC Berkeley is uh, Sam Webb uh, Williams. Uh, he's a PhD student uh, working with uh, Dave Patterson. Um, uh, with focus on computer architecture and VLSI. Uh, and he's going to talk about um, a software uh, analysis area for uh, tuning of uh, kernels in a multi-core architecture. And uh, before I hand it off to him, I need to somehow get this displayed over. Um, is that, uh, okay, and that, uh, do we get that over? Uh, <laughs> is there a switch or something? Um, Where is the guy? Yes, Randy available. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, there we go. Okay. So my name is Sam Williams, and I'll be discussing the, uh, what we describe as the roofline uh, model. It's a uh, tool that we actually developed over the last uh, few months for program analysis, and it's designed uh, to be much more readily understandable and a visually intuitive model than simply looking at CPI or, or TLB misses per instruction. So a brief outline that I'll actually go through for this particular talk. I'm going to start out with uh, some motivation, goals, audience, et cetera. And then the next three bullets are basically a survey of the uh, multi-core architectures I'll use, a introduction to the roofline model and description and build it up for those particular architectures, move on to a sidestep where I introduce auto-tuning, then combine those three bullets together and apply the roofline model to a pair of auto-tuned kernels, in this case, sparse matrix vector multiplication and a lattice bolt from that. Uh, method for uh, simulating a plasma turbulence uh, uh, fluid, and then finish up with a, a few conclusions. So, uh, multi-core itself guarantees neither good scalability nor uh, good attained performance. Uh, those performance and scalability metrics are typically very non-intuitive, even to computer scientists. And unfortunately, the success of this multi-core uh, paradigm is premised on the ability to actually program these machines. To that end, we must actually ensure that uh, uh, programmers understand that what the limits are to both scalability and efficiency. And the question becomes, how can we uh, empower those programmers to be more productive as they program these machines? 
So in this talk, my primary focus will be on throughput-oriented kernels. Those are where the metrics of success are going to be gigaflop rates, essentially uh, floating point operations per second. And we'll qualify those results based on percents of peak, percents of either uh, peak memory bandwidth or percents of peak flops. Uh, we're not focused on either algorithmic innovations, changing uh, uh, from order n squared to order lo n log n, and uh, we're not focused on uh, the latency of our particular applications. Uh, now, I will uh, premise that for this particular talk, I will focus solely on memory-intensive 64-bit uh, floating-point uh, SPMD, single-program multiple data uh, kernels. Now, the goals of the roofline model is to provide everyone, and especially undergraduates who will make up the bulk of the uh, uh, programmers of the future with a graphical aid that will uh, provide realistic expectations to both performance and productivity. Uh, we want to show the inherent hardware limitations for a given kernel and show potential benefits and how much potential benefit there is for each of the uh, optimizations that you may apply to it. Now, to be clear, the audience for the roofline model is not going to include those that are interested in fine-tuning. I believe that uh, an extra 10% is a rather uninteresting number when you may see orders of magnitude increases in performance from naively, uh, naively implemented codes to reasonably well-optimized codes. And, of course, we're not going to be focused on... It's not really for those that are challenged by parallel program correctness. If you can't write a, parallel, a correct parallel program, you shouldn't be focused on optimizing one uh, for performance. So let's look at the uh, multi-core SMPs that I'll use throughout this talk. Uh, in this case, we have uh, four dual socket uh, machines. In this case, I've laid them out so that we can actually see the uh, Intel's uh, quad-core Xeon, uh, as well as AMD's quad-core uh, Barcelona uh, machine in Opteron as well as Sun's uh, Niagara 2 SMP. In this case, it's two sockets uh, on a uh, shared memory uh, uh, node. Uh, each of those is a uh, multi-threaded, uh, highly multi-threaded uh, uh, chip. And then finally, we have the IBM uh, cell blade. In this case, it's the QS20 cell blade, the previous generation. Now, to be clear, three of these machines are going to be NUMA machines, the Opteron uh, cell blade and uh, Victoria Falls, while the Cloverton, as both sockets interface through uh, a memory controller hub to DRAM, is a uniform memory access machine. So, we can also think three of the machines will have a conventional cache-based memory hierarchy, and the fourth, to get optimal performance, the cell blade actually exploits a disjoint local store-based uh, memory hierarchy. Now, we're going to show throughout this talk that the roofline model is agnostic of, of the actual memory hierarchy. It will apply to both of them. Now, remember that uh, unlike the other three architectures, Victoria Falls, the Niagara 2 machine, each core is highly multi-threaded. Each core has uh, eight hardware thread contexts that it sw uh, switches between in order to hide both functional unit latency as well as memory latency. Uh, this is very different than the other machines which have to either uh, decouple uh, loads and stores from execution or have an out-of-order uh, execution mechanism to hide latency or hardware prefetchers. So if now that we're simply focused or for this particular talk on peak floating point rates, a naive programmer, perhaps an undergraduate, would simply say peak performance is going to be a function simply of peak flop rates for the various machines. And in this case, one may naively assume that Cloverton and Barcelona should deliver comparable performance on every application on every floating point application, and that uh, Niagara 2 and uh, the cell blade would deliver two or three times less performance. But remember, in today's world, we're much more memory constrained than ever before. So perhaps we actually should invite programmers to actually contemplate how much memory bandwidth they are, uh, each of the machines have. And in this case, the bandwidths differ by, well, let's say, roughly a factor of two, with the Opteron raw pin bandwidth being slightly lower than any of the other machines' raw pin bandwidth. Now, let me go ahead, take those uh, uh, machines, and introduce a roofline model for each of them. So first, let me be very clear on what we define as arithmetic intensity. Arithmetic intensity, for the case for floating point oriented kernels, will be the total number of floating point operations, i.e. our metrics of, of, of uh, our units of work, divided by the total DRAM bandwidth, how much uh, uh, memory traffic is actually presented to the memory subsystem i.e. all the cache misses plus all the uh, s essentially speculative misses that you may uh, generate through hardware prefetching. Now, for some problems like stencils, SPMV, lattice methods, the arithmetic is intensity is going to be constant with problem size. If you run a small problem or a large problem, 
they both have the same arithmetic intensity. While other kernels, like FFT and dense linear algebra, the arithmetic intensity will actually grow with the problem size. So, a naive roof line model. Uh, well, first of all, the real question becomes, should we, uh, should we expect uh, the, the somewhat naive programmers, the, the first generation of programmers, to be inundated with all the minutiae associated with CPI, cache misses per instruction, TLB misses per instruction, the effects of, of branch misprediction, or should we simply have a higher level uh, model that we can express to them? To that end, we believe that bound and bottleneck analysis will be much more readily assimilated by most undergraduate programmers and be uh, much more, uh, uh, be, be exploited much more efficiently. Now, to this end, we can simply say that the flop rate as a function of arithmetic intensity will be bounded by either the peak flop rates or the product of arithmetic intensity and stream bandwidth. Uh, now, if we were to take this naive model and plot it on a log-log scale, for our four architectures, we would see a slope of uh, uh, increasing performance as we increase arithmetic intensity to the point where we've actually saturated our peak flop rates. Now, different machines will saturate peak flop rates at different peak flop rates as well as at different arithmetic intensities depending on the machine balance. Now, unfortunately, this approach is somewhat unrealistic. Why? Because we have to have a huge number of optimizations either to get peak flops or to get peak bandwidth. Now the question becomes, how sensitive are each of these architectures to removing those optimizations? If we didn't do 100% of the optimizations, if we only did 9 out of 10, how much impact will there be to performance? Well, to that end, we can actually collect a series of stream bandwidth numbers as we begin to remove optimizations. So we create a vector of streaming bandwidths. Uh, depending as a function of, of optimizations included in them. Similarly, we can think about taking away optimizations from in-core flop rates. And as a result, we can uh, create a series of, uh, of roof lines, which we call ceilings, which are a, a combination of in-core flop rates with certain optimizations, as well as uh, uh, streaming band the product of arithmetic intensity with streaming bandwidth with certain optimizations. So if we were to take our previous naive roof line and start taking away uh, uh, optimizations, in this case, we will actually pay Let's think about the case where uh, on the Cloverton that our data set is sufficiently small that the snoop filter becomes much more effective. Well, you may actually get better bandwidth. But on the other machines, if we start taking away software prefetching, we'll get lower bandwidth. If we take away, uh, un if we take al away alignment for DMA operations on sale, we'll get lower bandwidth. If we take away our memory replacement optimizations, we'll get even lower bandwidth. Uh, and if we actually took one further step we and got rid of even unit stride memory access patterns, we'd even get lower bandwidth. Thus, for a given arithmetic intensity, we can look at, say, for arithmetic intensity 1, we may see that uh, a certain set of optimizations are actually going to be required for the various architectures. Um, let's see if I get the laser pointer. Right, so for Cloverton, uh, you may actually say for arithmetic intensity, one, you may need to do unit stride. If you fail, then your performance will be low. And if you do unit stride, then you probably uh, can get very close to the hand-optimized stream performance. While on other machines, at an arithmetic intensity of one, it's uh, going to be very sensitive to unit stride behavior and perhaps less so to uh, NUMA effects. And, and still, you may see some uh, effects for uh, software prefetching before you can actually reach peak streaming bandwidth. Now, we can do a comparable, uh, a complementary exercise for in-core flop rates rather than simply in-core bandwidths. Now, we can actually define uh, or at least assume that in-core performance could be limited by one of two major components. One is not satisfying all forms of in-core parallelism. And by that, I mean things like not expressing enough instruction level parallelism, not expressing data level parallelism, not having a balance between our functional units that we may have. And complementary uh, approach to this is, is the fact that we do have limited instruction issue bandwidth on these machines. So the more non-floating point instructions we put into our dynamic instruction mix, the less float, uh, instruction issue bandwidth we have for floating point instructions. As a result, we will get less and less bandwidth. Now, typically, one of these two components will be an Achilles heel for a given architecture. One of them, will, uh, the architecture will be sensitive to one of these two, more sensitive to one of these two. 
So if we were to say well, how much impact is there for not exploiting uh, multiply add imbalance on, on the optron, well, we may lose a factor of two in performance. And in double precision, what happens if we don't uh, symbize our code 100%? Well, we may lose another factor of two. And if we don't appropriately unroll or at least have enough instruction level parallelism where our out of order units can actually exploit it, we may lose another factor of four in performance. Now, something interesting actually has happened on Niagara 2. We actually have very little effects from not satisfying, uh, not expressing uh, instruction or data level parallelism. Why? Well, that machine doesn't have any SIMD for double precision. And two, it's very easy to hide in a multi threaded architecture a six cycle uh, floating point latency when you have eight hardware thread context to switch between. As a result, that machine is not particularly sensitive to either of those uh, forms of in core parallelism. However, if we move to uh, the fraction of instruction point mix, well, we may see it be much, much more sensitive as we start taking away floating point instructions and allocating a larger fraction of our instruction issue bandwidth to the non-floating point operations, to integer operations, to loads and stores, to whatever else is required to actually execute our kernel. Uh, so combined, these two actually tell us, you know, which particular uh, Achilles heel each machine may be sensitive to. Well, three of the four are probably going to be sensitive to in-core parallelism. The fourth, Niagara 2, will be sensitive primarily to the instruction uh, mix. Now, what have these roof lines, uh, what have these ceilings done? Well, they've gone to saying our performance is simply constrained by the roof line to saying our performance is now constrained by the lowermost ceiling. As a result, we've pushed our performance down for any arithmetic intensity to the low, potentially, without optimization, to the lowest most ceiling. Now, as a side note, the, it's an interesting observation to think that the thicknesses of these ceilings are somewhat indicative of how much software and, and compiler complexity is actually going to be required, how much optimization your work your, your programmers will have to do for these particular architectures. Machines with very thick ceilings require significant software in, infrastructure. The compiler will have to find all these forms of parallelism. It'll have to do all the software prefetching and all these other optimizations for you. While machines with very thin ceilings where you have hardware prefetchers that can detect very complicated stream, uh, access patterns or or uh, multi-threading architectures will have very thin ceilings, in which case the compiler and the programmer will have to do relatively little work by comparison. Now, what we can actually do is think about categorizing optimizations and applying to them to the roofline model. Now, in general, we can think of three categories of op software optimization. One is about maximizing in-core performance. How do you ensure that you know, once the data is actually in the, the first level cache or even the second level cache, you can get good uh, performance from that, from that uh, level of the memory hierarchy? Second, we can think about how do we maximize memory bandwidth? How do we pull uh, uh, data in and off chip very quickly? And this typically boils down to exploiting memory affinity, num optimizations, hiding memory latency, and expressing enough concurrency to the memory subsystem to satisfy Little's law. Now, the third category actually combines the, the previous two in the case of the roofline model. In this case, what we're actually going to do is try to minimize the memory traffic. And this basically boils down to addressing our three C's model for caches. We want to eliminate as many capacity misses and conflict misses, and perhaps, if possible, actually try to eliminate compulsory misses by changing data structures. So in the context of the roofline model, what, is, what do these optimizations do? Well, eliminating in core uh, or improving in core performance essentially allows us to punch through the horizontal ceilings and uh, that are constraining performance and actually get to higher uh, ceilings. Essentially, remove the red line as a constraint to performance. Similarly, when it comes to bandwidth, uh, this visualization would be very, I think, uh, useful for for the first uh, first year, second year, whatever uh, undergraduate programmers to think about how they actually improve performance. Well, they want to actually minimize, uh, to improve memory bandwidth. So you want to remove the red line as a constraint to performance. And when it comes to uh, uh, memory traffic, by minimizing the memory traffic, by eliminating conflict misses and compulsory misses, uh, we actually and uh, capacity misses, we actually improve arithmetic intensity. We're making the denominator smaller. So as we do that, we get closer and closer to the compulsory limit, the number of compulsory misses uh, uh, for this particular kernel. And that determines what the arithmetic intensity, the ultimate limit to arithmetic intensity is for that particular kernel. 
Now, let's go back to these optimizations. You know, each of these optimizations in the literature, we're provided with a number of optimizations corresponding to, to these categories. How do we actually go about choosing the optimal parameters for a given architecture? You think about register blocking, what's the optimal register block size? Is it four by two, is it eight by three? Same thing with cache block sizes, same thing with software prefetch distances. What are the optimal parameters? And to that end, we believe that automatic tuning of, of these kernels is a very tractable solution to delivering good performance. Why is this an issue? Well, out of the box code actually has certain perhaps unintentional assumptions on cache sizes and functional unit latencies. You know, code may assume that you have essentially a working set size of 10 megabytes in your cache, when in reality you only have a one megabyte cache. As a result, you'll generate a large number of capacity misses and performance will be diminished. So the goal for auto-tuning is to provide a nice performance portable solution across the existing breadth of, of microprocessors as well as their evolution as they move to more and more cores and different latencies and different cache topologies. Now the expense is a one-time upfront cost to productivity uh, to design this more general solution, but we'll amortize that across all the architectures we'll run on today as well as into the future. Now, to be clear, auto-tuning does not invent new optimizations. It simply takes the existing breadth of, of work and apply and does an automatic tuning, automatic search, uh, automated search of the optimization and parameter space. Typically, it's uh, defined by two components. One is a uh, co uh, code generator that produces all possible code variants that we may use. And the second is the actual benchmark, which will explore the space. So, to be very clear, how is this different? Uh, how are roofline and auto-tuning different? Roofline is going to tell the programmers what's deficient, but it won't tell them how to fix it. Auto-tuning will attempt to fix it by searching the parameter space for the existing optimization work. So, let's actually show a few examples. Let's apply the roofline model to a few sample kernels. Things to watch for, as I show simply the performance graphs, flops is a function of, of the problem. Does that alone give any insight to the typical programmer of, of what the limitations are? Does that allow him to qualify, is the performance good or is it simply just better performance? Can he make absolute statements rather than simply relative statements? Uh, does the roof line ultimately show the performance limitations for that particular uh, uh, kernel on that particular architecture? How much more potential benefit could he actually get from further optimization? Should he stop today or should he continue optimizing for the next month? And will it show which optimizations are necessary? So for the first kernel, let's look at a sparse matrix vector multiplication. This, the auto-tuning component of this work actually appeared uh, last year at SC 2007. So what's a sparse matrix? To be clear, it's like a dense matrix, except most of the entries will be zero. As a result, we only really need to uh, compute on and store the non-zeros. There's going to be a huge benefit in only uh, computing on 1% of the matrix, as zeros don't uh, contribute to the resultant value. Uh, the problem is, is this requires a significant amount of metadata to actually reconstruct the, the structure, the sparsity pattern of the matrix. And as a result, you typically have high instruction overheads, but also very, very low arithmetic intensity, uh, less than 0.16 flops per byte. So for SPMV, we're going to run it across a suite of, of various matrices that we've called from various sources. And on this particular graph, I'm going to show you uh, uh, flop rates for each of our four architectures as a function of the particular matrix, the data set. In this case, the purple will denote uh, the kind of naive uh, standard recipe for running SPMV, uh, and the blue is a simply, uh, simple par loop parallelization approach that you may apply, kind of both na uh, naive serial and naive parallel. Now we look at these machines and we can make statements about relative performance, one is faster than the other, but we really can't, and the typical undergraduate probably can't without any more insight, make any estimates as to uh, how good performance actually is. Uh, uh, it's very clear that moving from on Cloverton or on uh, Barcelona, moving from one core to eight cores on these two socket machines really didn't significantly improve performance. So we want programmers to be cognizant of why. Now, the standard solution in the past has been to simply run the auto-tuner on them and have it explore the entire parameter space and deliver better performance. But that really doesn't, isn't going to provide insight. That's only going to provide better performance. So in this case, we did that. And I've had to renormalize the axis because the performance on some architectures has increased quite dramatically. Uh, we can see that a number of optimizations are actually required. But the question remains, is this actually uh, simply better performance or is it good performance? 
So what we can do is take the roofline models, or a typical programmer could do, is take the roofline models for our four architectures, overlay the arithmetic intensity for SPMV around 0.16 flops per byte, show the out-of-the-box performance, show that uh, without any optimization it's at the low end of bandwidth. So what do we want to remove? We want to remove those ceilings which are acting to constrain performance. To that end, the auto-tuner can explore the Newman software prefetching space, deliver better performance, and we can actually go one step further and actually change the data structure to improve arithmetic intensity, essentially removing some of the superfluous metadata and actually getting better arithmetic intensity by eliminating compulsory misses. Now, all the machines at this point are on the roof line. We can say that we can't really get better performance. We're simply limited by the bandwidths of these particular machines. And at this point, we can say we're done. We don't need to do any further optimization work. Uh, there's nothing more that needs to be done. We've gone from making simply relative statements on performance to absolute statements on performance. Performance is good. Now, for the second example, this is a lattice Boltzmann code. Uh, in this case, you can think of it as a multi-component stencil where we actually have to read data from 73 different arrays, do about 1,300 flops, and then write data back to another 79 distinct arrays. And as it turns out, this gives us a flop to byte ratio of about one, so about six times greater than SPMV. So we can take our existing code, run it on these particular machines. Unfortunately, on the cell PPEs, the performance is almost uh, at the bottom of the screen. I'll eventually show SPE data, which will be significantly better. But one may naively simply look at this performance, say scalability, as a fun as in this case I'm showing two different problem sizes and performance as a function of the number of cores I'm actually using. One may naively say scalability is good, therefore performance is good. But we want to make a more quantitative assessment of that. So what we can do in the standard approach is to apply the auto-tuning framework, deliver better performance, show that performance wasn't good, uh, apply the roofline model, show the arithmetic intensity, show the naive performance, show the tuned performance, and actually go one step further and improve arithmetic intensity by eliminating some compulsory write traffic. At this point, three of the four machines are on the roofline. The fourth one is probably limited by uh, the instruction mix. So, a few conclusions. We believe, and perhaps you'll agree, that the, the roofline model is extremely visually intuitive. It tells that it's very easy for a given kernel to determine arithmetic intensity and thus performance and thus which optimizations are actually required. We believe that undergraduates will be very capable, very uh, uh, readily assimilate this data and apply it much more efficiently than they may be able to exploit something like CPI or cache misses. And we believe, in general, it's easily extended to other architectural paradigms, whether it be GPUs, network processors, whatever. And to that end, it's easily extended to other metrics. You don't have to just think about flop rates. You could think about sort operations per second, or graphics, or pixels, or crypto operations per second, or even integer operations per second. Coupled with that, you can think about other bandwidth metrics. Does it have to be always from DRAM bandwidth, or could it be from L2, or, P or PCI Express, or across the network? And ultimately, the goal, which is the current effort of, of research and development, is to actually move to using performance counters to capture runtime-specific information. Rather than just having an architecture-specific uh, roofline, let's look at a runtime-specific one where we've actually captured how much performance we've lost from each of these components and then visualize it on the roofline. So as a suggestion, you know, as our architectures and, and microprocessors are presented over the next two days, we invite you to go ahead and create a roofline model, even sketching it on a piece of paper for each of them. Contemplate what the actual ceilings will be to performance, how much work is actually going to be required on each of those machines, and then contemplate the actual performance and productivity among them. So a few acknowledgments, uh, questions. Any uh, questions? Uh, questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Sam. Thank you. Oh, you're here. Yeah, if you can do that, I'll introduce. <laughs> okay, um, so our next uh, talk is uh, Alex Mericus, and he's going to be talking on uh, 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 comparing 
microarchitectures, uh, both uh, within IBM and, and outside IBM, uh, I believe it was, uh, and looking at the, the, the power performance uh, comparison of these uh, uh, microarchitectures. Uh, he's a, a senior technical staff member in the Systems and Technology Group, um, and he's also going to have available to help with questions uh, Pradeep DeBose, who uh, is down here in front, uh, who's a manager in the IBM uh, Research uh, Computer Architecture Group, uh, focusing on, on power and reliability. And all right, the show actually looks like we're about up here. That's it. That's it. Okay. Hey, it works. Can you hear me? Am I? I don't think I'm live. We'll just keep talking. Okay, I'll just keep talking. That's right. Okay. Um, these are a couple of topics that we're going to go over today. Uh, I'm going to cover some of them briefly. I'm going to cover them some a little less briefly. Uh, I'm not intending to cover the, uh, the subject of uh, power management or comparative uh, uh, architecture in depth. Uh, it would take far longer than the amount of time we have today. Uh, so this is going to be more of a summary of these topics than it is going to be an in-depth uh, uh, search of it. Uh, and also, it's going to be more of a, a how we look at it within IBM, Pradeep, and, and, and I, and the, the people we work at, work with. Um, so one of the things that, that um, uh, my background is primarily as a performance uh, analyst. And as a matter of fact, um, uh, one of the things that uh, my, my previous job at IBM is I designed all of the uh, onboard uh, performance instrumentation for the processors, the uh, performance monitoring units for monitoring units for power four through uh, the, the, the current generation. So um, as a performance person, I tend to look, take, to look at things and, and want to count things and say, where did the cycles go, for instance, or, or where are the cache misses, or where, are, you know, where is the performance going? Um, for power, it, it's natural to want to look at it in the same way. Your initial view is, well, where is the power going? Where am I spending all my power? This is a picture, this is a power four. Um, it wouldn't be that different if we looked at power five or power six. Uh, we just happen to have this, this chart available. Um, th this is a, uh, a breakdown of where the power is going uh, by functional unit within power four. And, and looking at it from a functional unit is, is kind of a natural first step. And you know, as I said, as a, as a performance person, that's kind of how I, I looked at it, is where within the core is the uh, performance going, where is the power going. A Couple of things to notice. Uh, here, this is a risk machine. So um, the load store unit and the L2 are uh, two big components of power. And they happen to be two big components of performance, so that, that kind of makes sense. Uh, the other thing to notice, if you look over there at the, um, the layout, uh, you'll notice that the load store unit and the L2s uh, uh, make up most of the area on the chip too, a big chunk of the area. So um, a couple of things to note there is that uh, the power and the area are closely related. So another way to look at it is not just from a, uh, a functional unit standpoint, but what type of circuit is involved. Um, and, and here you'll notice that the uh, clock, uh, clock latches and the, uh, the arrays, um, the register arrays and stuff like that is where a large portion, the majority of the power is going. So uh, if we want to reduce power, if we want to manage power, uh, we'd, we'd want to look at the circuits that uh, make up the largest component of power, and then uh, also possibly look at the functional units um, that use the most. Uh, another way to look at it, what happened here? <laughs> Whoops, that's not quite the uh, picture I was, uh, did we get it? Yeah, there we go. There was the animation on that. Um, another way to look at it, so here's a picture of the, uh, and I think this is, uh, is this power four also pretty? Okay, so this is power four. Uh, this is just the, the picture of the chip. If you add um, the density of power, uh, another way to look at it is not just from a uh, functional unit, but also spatially. Where is the power being consumed on the chip? Uh, and you'll notice there's some hot, ch hot points uh, scattered around the chip. Now, hot points are important because they, uh, they complicate things in, in a couple of different ways. Uh, one, if you have an area of uh, a high power density, um, it, it complicates cooling because you're not spreading the uh, power over the chip. So you have to cool that one, one area 
um, and not, you know, the, the cooling requirements for the chip are dominated by that one little area. Uh, the other problem is, is that uh, power distribution on the chip might be complicated because one area needs more power than the other. Uh, there's some reliability concerns um, if one area is hotter or uh, particularly cooler than the other. And then also from a reliability standpoint, if, um, if the hotspots are dynamic. So if you have an area that's heating up a lot and then cooling off and then heating up a lot and cooling off, that can cause some uh, reliability concerns too. Uh, so these are ways that, that, that we kind of, from an overview, look at, at, at power. Um, I think I've said all that stuff. Um, now, a, as a performance analyst, it's, uh, it's natural for me to want to couple performance and power. And the natural first step to do is just to ratio whatever my performance metric is with watts. And, and that's not a bad way, first way of looking at it. So you might want to look at uh, instructions per watt, or in this case, I think on the, the top left, it's uh, specint uh, per watts. And, and, you know, that's not a bad way of looking at it at a processor level, but, but on some systems where uh, the, the really high performance uh, uh, processors, where performance might be more important, uh, it might be, be uh, the dominant thing you're looking at, you, what you might want to do there instead of just looking at the straight ratio is to square or cube the performance component so that, that it, it becomes more clear that way. And then on some of the big systems, if you look in the bottom, on some of the big systems um, where it's not so much the processor level performance, but it's the system level performance. These are processors that are meant to be built into large N-way uh, systems. In that case, you might want to look at a, uh, a system metric. And in this case, it was, and these are rather old numbers, but in this case, this is a uh, 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 TPMC per watt. And, and the, the comparison there, I mean, this is obviously not uh, a fair comparison. These are, are uh, it's a data processing it's a commercial system compared to systems that are not particularly strong in that, uh, in that area. Uh, another way that you might want to look at it, and this, these are just straight ratios where we're doing um, uh, performance over watt. Uh, another way you might want to look at it is energy. So um, maybe watt hours per transaction or kilowatt hours per transaction. Um, so, so that gives you a better idea of how much does a transaction cost. Uh, so if you can get a transaction done quickly, your, uh, the, uh, the amount of energy you use might, would show up and that would be less. Okay, now, so we, we've talked about the first way of how we look at power. We've looked at coupling uh, performance metrics with power. Uh, what are some of the things that, that uh, will affect um, what we'll call uh, power efficiency or, or your performance per, per watt? Um, there are lots of things. Again, I, I'm not going to spend the time to go over these in depth. Uh, I suspect it would take far longer than, than the 30 minutes I have just to cover this one chart. Um, so uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to do that. Uh, there, there are lots of things you can look at. The, the uh, standard microarchitectural micro knobs that we turn for performance reasons uh, also affect uh, the power, uh, pipeline depth, um, the complexity of the core, the number of the cores. Uh, there are also some things which I'll get into a little bit, power gating and, and uh, clock gating. Um, and, and all of these, and then there's circuit level stuff, uh, clock gating. Uh, different technologies and different uh, circuit uh, uh, disciplines and that type of stuff. Uh, all, all of these affect the power and the performance. And the key thing here is that they have to be looked at together. And as with most things, the earlier in the uh, design process that they're looked at, the better. Um, so just to start looking at some of these uh, microarchitectural uh, uh, concerns, um, I, we pulled one of them off the list, and it's just uh, pipeline depth. And what you have, um, uh, you have one uh, graph here which shows the uh, optimum pipeline depth for performance, for tuning for performance, and that, that's uh, optimizing towards uh, very short uh, pipelines. And then you have um, the other graph which is optimizing for power. And the key here, uh, is not so much what the actual uh, numbers are, but the key here is the two uh, graphs are different, the two plots are different. And so what's good for performance 
may not necessarily be good for power. And so you have to trade off between the two. OK, now the, another thing, um, the, one of the items that were pulled off is multi-core, which has gotten to be very popular lately. Uh, unit processor performance is not growing like it used to. Um, and in order to continue to drive the amount of throughput, to drive the amount of work that a, uh, a, a uh, single socket can do or a system can do, there's a move towards integrating more cores on a single chip. Uh, and in addition, there's a move towards increasing the number of hardware threads on each of the cores. So IBM saw this uh, uh, several years ago and we were a leader in integrating cores uh, per chip with Power 4, uh, introduced the multi-core uh, era. Um, around that time, I think a little earlier, we had coarse grain multi-threading on the RS-64 processors. And then with Power 5, we coupled the multi-thread, the multi-core with the fine grain multi-thread. And I'll show you in a bit, we'll show you how uh, uh, some of the benefits of that. Um, now, there's some other, there's a whole slew of other uh, architectural principles that uh, are starting to gain uh, interest. Um, one of the, I, I like to simplify it uh, with, uh, it's like what you tell your kids. Um, when you leave a room, turn the light off. If you're not watching TV, turn it off. Uh, and in some of those cases, you, it's not a whole lot. You know, you're, from your whole house standpoint, the power of a 60 watt light bulb is not that big. But over time, it adds up. It's the same thing in microprocessors. So I think there's, there's, there is an increasing amount of interest in turning off things that you're not using. Uh, there are some processors that have uh, that in different degrees. And uh, in, in the uh, power, process, power PC processors, we've implemented these to uh, varying degrees. Uh, a lot of it is uh, clock gating, where the clock arrays um, you saw were a major component of power. So if you can just turn the clock off to those, uh, you reduce it significantly. Um, power gating, uh, as opposed to, to clock gating, is also becoming uh, interesting, where you just completely turn it off, turn the circuit off. Um, there's also adaptive microarchitecture, architecture, where, for instance, if you don't need all the bandwidth on the chip, uh, maybe you turn some of the buses, cut them in half, um, reduce the latency to memory by slowing, mem I mean, increase uh, to memory by slowing the memory down if you're not memory bound, that type of stuff. Uh, but all of these have problems, particularly with high end processors, which is why you're not seeing them introduced as quickly as we might like. Um, they add complexity to an already incredibly complex uh, environment. Uh, and, and with that complexity comes verification cost. Uh, the overhead of adding the circuits to it. Um, and, and in some cases, um, these add relatively small amounts of power savings. And so it's hard to justify because of the complexity and the added cost of verification, that type of stuff, the relatively small overhead. And the example I gave there is the 60 watt bulb. It's really kind of hard to, to justify uh, turning off a single 60 watt bulb and, you know, for your entire uh, power bill. But one of the things, and unfortunately, I have to, to say at this point, and I think I'm going to mention it later, um, we didn't do a good job of, of talking about a, uh, another concept which is extremely powerful and has been very beneficial, particularly in the Power 6 um, uh, time frame, and that's dynamic voltage and frequency scaling. And it, it's very similar to these things that I, I talk about on this chart. Uh, and that's where... Um, if you don't need the frequency, the higher frequency of the processor, reduce it to the frequency that you do need. Uh, and as you reduce the, uh, the frequency, you can also reduce the voltage because uh, you don't have to get to those higher frequencies uh, on the chip. Uh, and that, that is an extremely uh, effective way of reducing power to a chip. Um, one of the things I want to talk about, and I mentioned it a couple of charts before, I want to go into a little bit more detail, is uh, multi-threading, simultaneous multi-threading. Uh, this is a pipeline uh, uh, diagram for, um, uh, I believe it's Power 5, but it could also be uh, Power 4 because they're almost identical uh, pipelines. And, and what you see here is you see the, the, the kind of bluish um, uh, boxes are those structures that had to be replicated to add multi-threading to the chip. 
And, and the other structures are the structures that are shared between the two threads. And, and one of the things you'll notice very quickly is there are not a whole lot of things that actually had to be replicated for us to be able to put multi-threading. So from a, from a uh, development standpoint, multi-threading was very effective, uh, very efficient. I mean, it, it didn't require a whole lot of changes to the chip, didn't require a whole lot of changes to the microarchitecture, um, and gave us a nice performance improvement. If you remember a couple of charts back, when I showed you the area plot on the, um, of the Power 4 processor, you'll also notice that the areas that were large in power use and large in area were the ones that are shared. So we're very effectively and very efficiently using those large power users as large area users, um, while the changes we had to, made were, had to make were in areas of the chip that were not big power users and were not big uh, area users. So in this way, adding uh, multi-threading to the design was uh, very efficient, both from a performance standpoint and from a power standpoint. And, and this chart uh, shows that um, we're looking at relative uh, energy use. Uh, on the left is uh, Power 4. It's actually Power 4 Plus. Uh, Single-threaded Power 4 compared to uh, single-threaded Power 5. The single-threaded Power 5 is, 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 uh, uh, has slightly higher uh, power use. This is without any clock gating or, or anything. Um, but when we add uh, sing, uh, SMT to that, it goes down dramatically, and then when we uh, turn clock gating on, it goes down even more. And um, uh, along with that, uh, not only were we more efficient per uh, thread, but we also got a performance bump at the same time from a, uh, a chip throughput standpoint. Um, now, uh, th this chart might be, the terms on it might be a little bit uh, uh, confusing when I talk about some of the, the stuff later on. Um, when I, on this chart, when I say dynamic power management, I'm specifically talking about clock gating uh, and how the uh, clock gating is done dynamically. And, and you'll see on the left is a thermal plot of a, um, uh, a chip, a uh, Power 5 uh, a chip um, without clock gating, single thread and multi-thread. And on the right is, uh, is a, the same chip with uh, dynamic clock gating turned on. And you can see very dramatically that uh, the one on the left is, is, uh, is hotter than the one on the right. So clock gating is very effective uh, in reducing the, uh, uh, the power and, and thermal characteristics. At, at, at both end, can I get back? Hello. Um, and, and in both cases, not just the uh, uh, single thread, but in the SMT also. So, um, and I have to apologize about this chart because uh, Pradeep and I realized as we put this together that, that this one causes some confusion with the chart uh, too later in the deck. But, uh, and I'm not going to go over in detail because uh, uh, I could probably spend, again, you know, 20 minutes on this chart by itself. But, but the bottom line here is that, um, uh, as I've said several times, the clock gating has uh, very, been very efficient, uh, very effective in the Power 5 uh, design. Uh, what's shown here and where it's confusing is that this is specifically for active power. There are two components of, of uh, uh, power in a circuit. There's the active power, which is you know, the, the switching power, and then there's leakage that, that as long as the, um, the circuit is powered, uh, you're going to be leaking some power. Um, and, and so this only shows the active, the switching power. Uh, now, moving on from power 5 to power 6, uh, the significant thing about uh, Power 5 to Power 6 is that they have the same uh, power envelope. So the Power 6 was designed, and in many cases I believe the, um, uh, it was physically a replacement where uh, they're field upgradable. You take a Power 5 uh, processor board, you take it out, and you put a Power 6 processor board. And, and because of that, they're designed so that um, they don't need new power supplies, they don't need new uh, thermal stuff and all that. They, they fit in the same power envelope. But as you can see by the, uh, the bars, uh, Power 6 gives dramatically uh, more power, uh, more performance, excuse me, within that same power envelope. And uh, a major component of that is uh, more aggressive clock gating. And here's the chart where things get confusing, and I, I apologize about this. Uh, with with uh, this chart, it's showing um, the, the, uh, 
the leakage power on the bottom is, is relatively constant. It's been estimated here at 30% of the overall uh, power. And then the active is above that. Um, and, and you can see the, um, the clock gating, uh, the effect of the clock gating on the power six. If I were to redraw the power five uh, bars uh, using the same method, uh, power five would be um, somewhere around 80%. Um, maybe a little above, a little bit, a little bit below. Uh, and you, so you can see that the power six clock gating is um, uh, more effective, uh, more aggressive than uh, the power six. Um, the other benefit of, of clock gating is that, uh, particularly with the way we did it on power six, is it also helps with the thermals. So um, you can have a situation where um, you've got your, your the bars here, which is our warning, thermal warning and thermal critical. Uh, you can actually run at a higher frequency with clock gate, dynamic clock gating um, without exceeding your thermal, um, thermal boundaries. So not only does it uh, uh, help you become more efficient with power, but it also uh, helps your, um, uh, your, your cooling situation. So those couple allows you to deliver more performance within the same power envelope. Uh, so just a brief overview. Um, going from power four to power five, there wasn't a lot of clock gating in uh, power four, it's very minimal. Uh, power five, we added clock, dynamic clock gating um, to, to help manage power, but at the same time we added uh, SMT, which was very effective, not just only from a, uh, an area a standpoint, but also from a, a power standpoint. Uh, power six um, have roughly the same uh, power envelope, uh, higher frequency design, uh, much more aggressive clock gating. And then another piece, which uh, we talk about it in one of the later charts that's in the backup, that I really wish I'd, I'd put here, um, one of the big differences between power five and power six, is we now have support for dynamic voltage and frequency scaling. And as I mentioned, that is a very effective uh, mechanism for reducing power. And, and it's one of the, the, the knobs that we use uh, quite a bit on power six now that uh, if, if you don't have the demand uh, for performance, you can reduce your frequency down. Uh, as you reduce your frequency, you can start pulling your voltage down. And uh, that's probably the, uh, the biggest knob we have for reducing power at this point. Um, I'm gonna talk very briefly about this. Uh, I, I guess there has been some, um, uh, I don't know, talk about, uh, the difference between chip multiprocessing and SMT that um, uh, from a thermal standpoint, pretty, you, you're probably better at discussing this chart than I am. From a thermal standpoint, that, that uh, SMT uh, might not be as uh, advantageous as chip multiprocessing. And what this chart shows is that uh, comparing single threaded uh, peak uh, temperature to SMT and chip multithreading, that SMT and, and chip multiprocessing are roughly the same. So SM, again, SMT is very uh, uh, effective, both from performance area, and, and this is showing from a thermal standpoint. So I wanna switch gears a little bit. Uh, I know I'm getting close to the end of, of the talk, and um, I, I, I wanna put us back on schedule after a little uh, hardware glitch there. Take a slight change of uh, shifting gears and look at some other uh, products in the IBM portfolio. Um, there's a session later on today on Cell, so I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but uh, Cell is um, a very power efficient design, and, and one of the things that helps is that it is not a general purpose design. It, it, it is fairly specifically designed um, uh, for, for the type of work it does, uh, a lot of floating point stuff, uh, uh, the games processor, that type of stuff. It, it's closer to a uh, accelerator than a uh, general purpose processor. Um, and because of that, um, a lot of the design uh, trade-offs that I talked about before, uh, it, can, it can go in different directions. Uh, another example is a BlueJean, um, which again was designed for fairly specific applications and was not a general purpose processor. And um, in their problem, in their market, their problem space, uh, these two processors are uh, the most power efficient um, systems out there, as uh, you can tell from the, uh, the green 500, where the top 10 are all 
uh, systems that are made up of either the blue gene or the uh, system that has some cell component. And then I think that was the, uh, the, the concluding remarks that I wanted to, to make is that um, uh, power and uh, power performance trade-offs is a, a complex, uh, complex problem. Uh, if you affect one, uh, it may change the other in a way that you, it's not desirable. So to come up with the optimum uh, decision point has to be looked at early in the design and, and has to be revisited throughout the design. Um, that there's going to be a lot of uh, changes, I think, in the future on this. As I'm looking forward to the conference her hearing about some new techniques that, uh, uh, some new levers that hopefully we can pull. And that uh, you know, the optimization that you might do for a, um, a cell type processor or a laptop type processor is considerably different than what you might do for a data center um, uh, uh, high throughput commercial system such as the, uh, the Power 5, Power 6 processors. And then there's some, there's some backup stuff of, of kind of the, some up and coming uh, ideas and stuff we've looked at. I, I've run out of time, so I'm not going to uh, go through those right now. Uh, if you'd like, Pradeep and I are going to be around for today and tomorrow. You can come talk to us uh, uh, offline. Are there any questions now? I have a question. Uh, Voyner Club, University of Texas. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk uh, certain figures of merit like a power delay, uh, energy delay, energy delay square, energy delay cube, and so forth. They all come as direct derivative from hardware intensity, which is introduced by one of your co-authors. And I know that in IBM you design for a particular hardware intensity. That's how you determine how everything in the processor is being designed which is a function of what application demands and technology chosen. Uh, how do you determine the optimal hardware intensity, in particular for a general processor where always more performance is better? Um, I'm trying to paraphrase your question so that um, the, the, the hardware intensity, if I understand the, the way you're stating it, is dictated more by the marketplace than so, so we design our processors. We're trying to go after a certain uh, point in the market, and, and um, you know, to some extent, we have to respond to that. Uh, that's why you see certain designs are are um, are able to do things like the cell processor, for instance, is designed for a different point than the Power Six processor, and because of them, you know, Power Six is very power efficient in in the applications that it does well on. Whereas Power 6 has to be more of a general purpose processor. Thank you. Ashwin, PhD student. I believe uh, Power 6 uses uh, in order execution against out of order execution of Power 5. So, uh, although there's no uh, instruction level parallelism that's been exploited in Power 6, how does it keep up with the performance of Power 5? Um, well, um, to some extent, it's, um, uh, it runs at a higher frequency, so that helps. Um, but but there, were also from my, there were also several microarchitectural um, changes that were made. Um, th this would be a, you know, easily a one-hour talk. And I think last year, uh, there was actually a presentation on Power 6. So uh, if, you, uh, if you look through the conference proceedings from last year, uh, I believe there was an overview of Uh, one more question. One more. And you're the lucky one. Paritosh Kulkarni from MIP Technologies. So I assume Power 6 is, uh, in, in, in terms of process geometry, that's a lower node. What are you doing about leakage power for Power 6 and, uh, you know, the latest processors? Um, well, <laughs> so um, I can't talk in specifics, of course. Um, but, you know, for leakage power, um, a big concern is what I was saying before, that if you're not going to use it, turn it off. Um, so there's a lot of interest in power gating, uh, that if you're not going to use a unit and turn it off. Of course, that, that drives a lot of problems. Um, uh, there is the overhead of turning it back on again. There's a reliability concern about what happens if you can't turn it back on again. 
uh, that type of stuff. So there's a lot of interest in, in power gating. Um, maybe Pradeep could talk about there are probably some other techniques that we're looking at for dynamic voltage frequency scale and I didn't mention about that one of the benefits of that is and and with with clock gating is, is not only does it reduce your power uh, but it also reduces the temperature that you run at and as you reduce the temperature your leakage goes down so so I mean that that has a benefit of it um, you know obviously turning it off would be the best way to get rid of leakage but 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 by by uh, uh, dynamic voltage frequency scaling is a, is a very powerful knob so let's give Alex uh, and Pradeep uh, thanks. So, so that uh, concludes uh, the first session um, for this morning. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take a, a break until 11:15. Uh,